This is Governor Larry Hogan, and I don't always have time to listen to podcasts, but uh, I do enjoy listening to the Maryland Crabs podcast. Live from a grungy kitchen table located in Annapolis, Maryland's scenic and historic capital, it's the Maryland Crabs podcast. With each episode, your hosts, Tim Hamilton, John Frenet, and the occasional guest will dive in and pick apart the stuff that really matters most to you. We're too lazy to actually solve any of these problems, but we can definitely stir the pot. From schools, politics, parking in the fire lane, to those horrible people who drive BMWs. And here with this week's episode, live from the kitchen table, Tim Hamilton and John Frenet. And welcome back to the Maryland Crabs. It is Thursday, it's noon, so that means that we've got to do something, right? Eat Thanksgiving dinner. That's right. Happy Thanksgiving to everybody. I am in... Altoona, Pennsylvania. Not right now. No, you're not. By the time you're listening to this, I am in Altoona, Pennsylvania. I'm in the mountains I mean, I know, of I, western Pennsylvania, and the high is predicted to be 29. I know Annapolis is bad, but it's not Altoona bad. This episode, we promised you Heather Mazir. We are liar heads. And no, we're not liar heads. She was going to be you're here, a liar but head. she uh, she called me last week and said she had a really horrible upper respiratory bronchitis type of a thing. And she had to do a commitment that she was committed to, and she didn't think she could do both of them. So we are going to get her rescheduled. Uh, she's excited. And actually, I'm a little bit more excited about that because I think we may go out to her studio and do it in her place out in, on the Eastern. We're going to have Studio Envy. I want to see what her studio looks like. I do, too. She looks like a very exacting person. So when we go there, I think I'm going to be embarrassed about our setup. Although okay. we're set up everywhere. We're in John's home studio right now. But then we also set up a, like a portable studio that's just as elaborate down at the Commons. So we're not too bad. No, I mean, we're not... Yeah, we're not doing it on the iPhones. No. So that's, uh, but that's good. But I do want to thank our guest this week, which is Anne Arundel County Councilman Jerry Walker. Uh, And I I don't want to say he was stepping in because he was on our hit list, but he was able to come in. He was accelerated schedule. He he was accelerated. And actually, it turned out very well because of uh, a problem that he's got going on right now with a bunch of hate mail. Not hate mailers. He don't say hate mailers, but negative mailers. He's got an issue. We needed a guest. And it all just worked out perfectly. It it really really did. And it's... We had to drive out to Crofton, though. Crofton was fine. we, We sat there we had uh you know drinks at the nautilus diner i like that diner i love diners but that, that there's no one in there you too but we never actually ate anything because we had to get it back was four o'clock in the afternoon or three o'clock in the afternoon so there wasn't jerry and i talked pizza because he's from new york new york so he commiserated with me about uh the problem with pizza in maryland he gave me a couple tips because there's a place out there that i haven't i didn't have time to try because it was rush hour and i had to go get my kids but i was anxious too that is true and also we have per- Potentially some changes coming up to the podcast in 2018. Yes. You want to tell them what they are, Tim? Well, <laughs> we want to, uh, we're want we looking to expand a little bit. So we're looking for a third mic, third voice, because we are covering so much ground right now between the crab cakes and between the shows that our schedules are sometimes doesn't allow it because we have to do a lot of juggling. So we're looking for uh, a third voice. Not to be here every week, not to be here for every episode, but kind of not, not even as fill-in, but just kind of a, a third person to give some perspective. Absolutely. I think that would be great. And from a purely, I guess, production standpoint, I would like to see a female voice. Yeah, but John's sick of me. Uh, well, I think I think it's confusing that if you have two male voices and you throw in another male voice, then you, you're sort of thinking like, well, was that Sean? Was that, you know, who was that Tim? Was that yeah. John? Was that... Uh, so I think a female voice would be be good. We promise no inappropriate stuff. We will not have to make any apologies down the line or anything like that. I don't have the energy, frankly. <laughs> I, I don't. To be inappropriate, it's just not... It's not um, because I'm a gentleman. It's just because I'm kind of tired. It could be. It could be. But if you are interested in that, if you know somebody that might be interested, be somebody that would be kind of into the, you know, what's going on in Maryland, just sort of in tune with that. Maybe it's politics. Maybe it's just a different issues. Uh, not not entirely centric to Annapolis because we do want to expand out into other parts of the state as well. So, But if you just sort of have a, a thought that it might be something fun, something new to learn, uh, the pay totally sucks. Yeah, but the benefits... They are, suck, too. Oh, no, but uh, the, the well, the perks are none. Yeah, yeah, they suck, too. Sometimes we do drinking ones. You know, you know what? Here, you want the perks? Mm-hmm. I was at the Moose Lodge for Free Range Improv on Saturday night, and I had a Moose member come up to me... And punch you? And say, hey... You and Tim did a great job on the elections. Oh. So there was a per there there so, was a per. And actually this is a genuine thing cuz you didn't tell me this stuff. Yeah, no, no, this was genuine. It was funny. It was I was we went to the Moose Lodge and we thought Free Range Improv said there was going to be food there to buy. And we got there and the food was all gone. Apparently they served the food to the moose first. Oh. 
Uh, so there was nothing, and we were we watched the Free Range Improv, which is a hysterical show. But it was I've uh, seen them before; they are funny. Yeah, yeah. and uh, but, but boy, by the time they were done, man, we were hangry. Uh-huh. <laughs> we had like six of us, and we're like, okay, let's go to Ramshead real quick. Uh-huh. Yeah, so we shot up to Roadhouse and got some burgers and quesadillas. Their, their chicken quesadillas are good up there too. So if you join the Maryland Crabs team, you too can get random compliments at Moose Lodges and Elk Lodges and yeah, uh, Water Buffalo Lodges and all those things. That's true. But seriously, if you are interested or if you know somebody that's interested, have them get in touch with us. You can tap us out on email at info at the Maryland Crabs dot com. You could probably tweet us and stuff like that, which would be the MD Crabs podcast. But if you're not interested, just make sure you're telling all your friends about us and pimping us out on Apple Podcasts and Google Play and everything else so everybody knows where we are and share the share the great work that we do. Yeah, we have a lot of lines in the water, too. We have uh, a lot of emails out to Maryland celebrities and Maryland personalities, and sometimes they get back to us, and oftentimes they don't. Sometimes they say maybe. Other times they give you a hard no. I have, I've got my second no from John Waters' assistant, but uh, she seems to be weakening, so I'm going to keep working on that one. No restraining orders yet? Not yet. Well, I'm a gentleman about it. I'm very... Uh, I try to be funny about it. That's very good. Well, I'll tell you what. Why don't we um, take a quick break? We'll come back in. We'll get into it with Anne Arundel County Councilman for District Whether 7. it's Main Jerry Street, Walker, find your out street, or any street in the county find out that we all live in what's and love, for him. And call Anne Arundel. Anne Arundel County. It's a special right, place. But part of living here is having a bank that provides what you need when you need it. So when your plans and dreams call for a bank, turn to us, your neighbor. We're Severn Bank, supporting the community that supports us. I'm Alan Hyatt, chairman of Severn Bank, and it's our honor to be the bank that serves the people of Anne Arundel County. One thing that we never forget is that as a member of this community, it's our responsibility to be committed to helping you and our county thrive. Like you, we live here, we work here, and we play here. Severn Bank, we're here with you. Online at SeverinBank.com. Member FDIC, Equal Housing Lender. Severn Bank is a trade name used by Severn Savings Bank. We are here at the Nautilus Diner in Crofton with Councilman for Man Arundel County, Jerry Walker. How are you today? I'm doing great. You just got done with your shovel down at Crofton High School. I did. Very great, awesome moment for Crofton. Oh, I thought that was your day job, that you were a construction worker. Oh, yeah, no, yeah, no, no. Yeah, quick, put, quick, put on the bow tie and then... And, and, and get the and shovel in the... <laughs> but uh, Crofton High... Let's talk a little bit about Crofton High School. It came, it's been a long time coming. The dirt is being moved now. It is. Uh, in 2010, when I started to run for county council, I went, did a lot of door knocking, knocked on thousands of doors. And in Crofton in particular, people were just like, when is the Crofton High School coming? We've been wanting it for 40 years. And I remember one guy in particular who had a hat, a Virginia Tech hat on, and he said, my daughter is going to Virginia Tech, which is why I'm wearing this hat. And he said, when we moved here, she was five, and I was promised then that we'd have a Crofton High School, and we still don't have one. And so I told him I'd work on it, and, uh, you know, it's been a huge effort, a uh, huge undertaking, not from just myself, obviously. There's a lot of people that were involved, but pr- primarily Jonathan Boniface here in Crofton has really led the movement so and really motivated the community and got folks down to the Board of Education and down to the State House to testify and um, really driven the need for it. So And, uh, and now, now it's there. And now it's here. Ba- basically, Crofton right now splits Arundel High and South River. That's right. We had about 750 students at Arundel and about 750 at South River. And, you know, especially for the South River parents, it's like a 30, 35 minute drive one way you know it can be yeah. um if there's not traffic you know Plus if there's the population traffic has grown so much in the last 40 years population has really grown in this area and there's even more folks wanting to move here you know because it's such a nice area so that's true that's true well congratulations on the accomplishment of uh Anne Arundel county government and you certainly as a uh, representative of the constituents here in thank you district five right seven seven, seven. yeah seven. seven come on seven. john yeah, I know. I get my districts confused. Okay, <laughs> Sorry, sir. Come That's all right. No worries. Um, you are term limited. I am. Uh, so you've done your eight-year sentence. and, <laughs> and now It's you- been a pleasure to serve. It really has. I've, I've learned a tremendous amount, met a lot of neat people, and uh, really enjoyed the sort of learning experience. Was this your first me. public office? I ran for and was on the Central Committee, the Republican Central okay. Committee for the county, and I actually served as the Republican Party chairman for the county um, on the Central Committee for uh, – I got elected to that in 2006, and it was right about that time when I got elected to that that I met Senator Riley, who was the councilman in this yeah, seat yeah, yeah. before. Big Ed, that's right. Big Ed's awesome. So, he's uh, nine foot he, three. 
most people don't know that. <laughs> Is that right? <laughs> he's uh, he's great. I have my my nationwide insurance agent happened to know him and knew because through the nationwide family, I guess. And he said, hey, if you'd like to meet him for lunch or something, just because he's your state senator or your county councilman at that time, he said, I'd love to set it up. So we set it up. We sat down and talked. And he said, well, I'm term limited. I've only got four more years left, and you should consider running for my seat. And I said, well... I've just gotten elected to the Central Committee. I don't even know what – I've got to figure that right. part out first, you know. And about eight months later, I decided I wanted to, you know, to do it or explore it at least. And so I started coming to county council meetings and kind of stuck my finger in his belt loop and followed along behind him and went to community meetings and learned the issues in the community. And then a couple of years later, started fundraising and door knocking and all the things that you do for And this is the, new guy. This is the new guy in District 7. Yeah, yeah. So this was your first, I'm going to say, public-facing Correct. Yeah. Central Public committee office. was, you know, obviously it's an elected position, but it's not. That's behind the scenes. Correct. It's, it's it is behind like, the scenes. It's a party people, building people kind of the thing. Booth and they go, what the hell is this? Those that are the is... power players. You guys are the guys in the back room with the cigars. Exactly. And... No, it's not even that. It's like you're showing up at the fair. You're, you know, you're marking, marching in the parades for 4th of July. I mean, it's, it's a, it serves a vital role for the party, for party building. You know, the Democrats have one. Republicans have one. And they're both pretty active here in the county. So. Right. And then you had four years and then you ran again. The, and correct. you got another four. Yep. I sure did. I sure did. Sure did. So well, congrats. And, and you are on to District 33 in the House of Delegates. State Delegates. That is, that is the goal. That's the plan. That's and the right plan. now that's uh, what? Mike Malone, Tony McConkey, Sid Saab. Correct. That's right. You got it. Right. Yep. It's Those a three-member district. It the, used to be before the 2010 redistricting, it was a split district. There was two members and then up here and then one member to the south. Bob was Costa was Bob the— Right. Okay. And then they moved the lines around in 2010, and it's a three-member district now. So, Who are you looking to bounce? Uh, you know, I don't, I'm not looking to bounce anybody in particular. I'm just trying to, I'm just running for the office, you know, and there's obviously I have my suspicions of who, you know, I think would, would probably, that I would probably beat, but I, you know, it's up to the voters, I guess, to right. decide who, who they're going to cast their three votes for. Right. So. And at this point, you've got also a democratic challenger in Pam Luby, I believe. Correct. Yes. Um, correct. And she's over in what, Arnold way? I believe that's correct. I think, yeah. I think yeah, so. I've met her so. once or twice. And there's still some time to file. You may, there may be some other people that will. I'm sure. That will draw in there. I it, understand that County Executive Leopold will be running. He is running. I, sure. Yeah, he's been, Simon he's been, he is, yeah, he's been knocking on doors from what I understand for over a year. I will yeah. give him so, credit too. We'll say this: he invented the sign waving. He is the the founding father of the sound waving sign waving movement. That's what I've heard, and he, he, heard. he did really well. But now we're going to be talking to him in a little bit. He was last time I talked to him, he said he wasn't sure whether he might look for a county council or um, a delegate seat again. And with I think with Megan Simon Air stepping aside, that sort of opens it up for them, and uh, it'd be interesting to see. Does he live up there? Yeah. Oh, yeah, Pasadena. Yeah, yeah. Up, up in the Dina. We wanted to talk to you. You would. Uh, you're now a. A victim. I don't know. We'll portray you as a victim, but your your campaign, which is I would like to I'd like to say target okay, instead I'll, of victim I'll... because I think it's it's like I told people at my latest uh, fundraiser a couple of months ago. If you're over the target, that's when you start taking flack. So I think I'm over the target, which is why I'm taking flack. I mean, but, they wouldn't be they wouldn't be sending out these types of mailers against me if they weren't worried about. But me. that's a good place to be. Then that's it is my if opinion. You, if they ignored you, you'd be a little bit hurt. <laughs> well, this a little bit of a backstory on this. Your campaign is just getting started, effectively. Mm-hmm. I mean, you're sort of wrapping up your last year at the county council, and Correct. you're ramping up to run for district 33. You've got a primary. You've got a you know. So we've got this, and now this early in the campaign, you're seeing negative mailers that are coming out against you that you're not the right candidate for the office as a Republican. And they're claiming they've got very familiar pictures of clowns and, and whatnot, which is very similar to what we saw several weeks ago. In I the think city these are a little more creative because they, they've got him juggling and they did a really good Photoshop. <laughs> they job. photoshopped that's, me into a clown suit. That's and everything. a good yeah. shot of you, actually. Yeah. Not bad. At least the head part. Exactly. Yeah. And there's four balls in the air, not just your traditional That's three. true. So that's true. That's actually, Shows that's, I'm talented. That is, as <laughs> far as the clown world, world that's pretty high level clowning there you go and i will say that you've got it does show you that you have two red balls in the air and only one blue true so True. I, mean, I hadn't considered know, that a little bit more a little bit more <laughs> focused toward so we're looking at two pieces here toward the red Mar- red maryland or uh, whatnot but what what is the purpose of this i mean now i've always thought that in a primary the the central committees or the PACs or whatever it is tend to be hands off let let the water settle let everything shake itself out and then we sit there and we go again we go with the people that we've chosen in the primary and we go against the opposite party this is something new that i've seen here I mean, I think this is uh, this is actually these these mailers were paid for by the Republican House Caucus, which is you know run by the Minority Leader Delegate Kipke, and I strongly suspect that 
de- the county executive is behind it. He hasn't been happy with me um, since early on in our – Well, the county his, executive myself. and – uh, Delegate Kipke, we're behind the Preserve Annapolis now, which was, you know, the ones that were sending out uh, against Gavin Buckley in Annapolis. They were. They were. And I think they admitted that in the paper. So. Yeah, it was in the <clears> paper. They, they, not, went, they yeah. went back and forth on whether they did or not. They, right. I, think, I think they said they were behind it, but they hadn't written the checks yet, and they tried to weasel, <laughs> right. weasel out of it. Right, exactly. Like Going back to the clown well, though. I mean, it's highly unusual, right? I mean, and I think it, what's interesting, probably the, the most interesting thing about this is you've got, you know, the governor who is obviously interested in gaining seats, right, in the General Assembly. He's interested in gaining enough seats in the House and in the Senate to block the veto overrides um, that sure. he's been putting through. And so, you know, the Republican Party at the state level has come up with a plan and they're targeting Senate seats and House seats to try to pick up these seats to help the governor. And so when people give money to this House Republican caucus, I would strongly suspect that the people who are funding the caucus are doing so with the thought that the governor is this is going to help the governor ultimately if we can add additional Republicans in the legislature. I'm sure they probably weren't told that the mail with the, like this was going to be generated attacking a Republican, Republican. And not just a Republican candidate, but a sitting Republican elected official, too. I mean, I, I've been in this role for seven years, and it's not like uh, some newbie to the county that's not – doesn't have Republican credentials. I think I have in them. No, no. With that, without a doubt, you have. And, and, I mean, it appears to be protecting the three – Well, and that's, that- what I think, been their talking points to this point. You know, when I reached out to Delegate Kipke in a text message and asked him if he was behind us because I assumed he was because he's the leader of the PAC, um, he said – his response was basically that he and the leadership support the sitting three delegates, which is extremely interesting, obviously, given the fact that, you know, one of the delegates is uh, appointed, right? Um, Mr. Malone is appointed. Right. And and Delegate McConkie in particular he's, is interesting he's had because— all sorts of problems uh, with the real estate license. He's been censured and everything else there as well. And censured. Think, he owes the state thousands of dollars in fines still that he's not paid off. And he, I don't think— disbarred, um, lost think his real estate s- license. He's s- got issues. Um but, uh, yeah, I mean, there's – I remember at the 4th of July parade, Tony McConkey was, you know, marching in the parade with his yellow T-shirts. And I felt bad for him because there was, like, this contingency at the foot of Main Street screaming, hey, Tony, have you kicked any old ladies out of their house lately? And they were just chanting it, chanting it, chanting it. I felt really bad for him because it was certainly inappropriate and not the right place to do it. But, again, you know, aside from some of the votes that you may have cast on the county council that the county executive did not agree with or perhaps Delegate Kipke did not agree with, you know, there's been there's been nothing – I mean, you were the chairman of the council during the time when you had the transition from John Leopold to Lauren Newman, I that's, believe. That's correct. You know, you've led led the county as chairman. You've served twice, twice, twice. through some pretty tumultuous times and mm-hmm. issues. Yep. Admirably so. There haven't been too many, uh, you know, problems that, have, I, that, I've, that I've been any that I've heard. No, and, you know, going back to the voting thing, I think that's what, you know, one of the things they keep hammering that somehow I'm voting with the Democrats all the time. When, in fact, if you look at the county executive's legislation, all the bills that the county executive has sent down— I I have voted either for his legislation or with another Republican against the legislation 97 percent of the time. So there's been 3 percent of the bills that he's put down that I've either voted against maybe by myself or with some of my Democratic colleagues. So if you look at the actual – and I that was numbers I ran about two months ago. And I went back and looked at every bill that we voted on since Mr. Shu has been county executive. So I have voted for like 92.6 percent of the bills that he's put in. And the, of the remaining percentage, like half of those, I've voted against. It, but I voted with another Republican against it. So it wasn't so it Councilman was, Walker running off on his own just to cast a n- negative vote? No, and not caucusing with the Democrats, which is what they continuously accuse me of doing. I question the wisdom of this in general. I mean, and this, I was paying attention to what's going on with Donna Brazil's book and everything when when they were accused of damaging one of their own candidates. That had he gone to the general, it was going to be an issue because they did the damage, and that happened with uh, Obama <coughs> in 2008. So I'm looking at something like this. I question the wisdom of damaging a candidate. Not looking beyond the primary, that all of a sudden, you know, this, you, you're carried through the primary and you're in the general, then they have a narrative that they built up that you're saying is not based on facts, on, on voting records, that all of a sudden, that seems very short-sighted to me when you're trying to claim uh, the House and it, that, it, that seems very I- difficult. To rationalize. I agree. I agree. I mean, I, I couldn't agree more. And and the other thing is, you know, it really, if you think about it, if you're a sitting delegate, too, if they're willing to do this against someone, a Republican who's running, what happens if you're a delegate in the state legislature and they decide, well, you're not on the team? And all of a sudden they're using funds to try to take you out, you know, in a primary. Um, so, I mean, th- this sort of sets a dangerous precedent, I think. 
because I'm, to my knowledge, and I've talked to former members of the legislature and even some of the current ones, and nobody can recall that this has ever happened like this before. Well, on the, on the surface, you look, if they're looking to protect Michael Malone, Tony McConkie, and Sid Saab, you know, on a three-seat position, mm-hmm. and you've got a Democrat that's actively running, she's strongly running, she's... I'm going to say undoubtedly probably has the support of all of the surge and the uh, the offshoots of the Women's March. You know, I don't know her qualifications per se to be a delegate, but I would certainly think that her support is fairly strong. Mm-hmm. Uh, granted, it is a little bit of a Republican thing, but I mean, we're, some people are not happy with Tony. And I, I don't think that Michael Malone and Tony McConkie's seats are safe. And, and this could do the exact same thing that it did in Annapolis and turn this thing around and turn around and give it to Pam Luby. Very well could. Very easily. Especially given the whole mood. And you just looked at the, you mentioned the Annapolis City mailers and the Annapolis City elections. And then we all saw the same thing happen over in Frederick, uh, yep. in Frederick City as well. Anything could happen. And this is just sort of, but I get it doesn't build the party. And that's, and that's what this is. Th- this pack was designed to do is to build the Republican Party's footprint in the legislature. And instead is turning around and attacking a Republican. Well, this seems to be, I mean, we've, I think we've got a fairly strong uh, candidate in Ron George for the Senate. Agreed. Um, to pick up there as opposed to, you know, going against whether it be Sarah Elfreth or whether it be going against John Astle. We're not sure what he's going to be doing at the end. Yeah, I, I think there is some options to pick up additional seats in the legislature. And this is going to be one of those, it seems to me, a three-step forward, two-step back type of a thing. And it makes no sense personally to me. Well, be, yeah, beyond the whole sense thing, I think, you know, the other question really is the accuracy of what's been put in the mailers, you know, and this most recent mailer has to do with a bill that I introduced um, that has to deal with medical marijuana dispensaries. And you're a pothead, fr- aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not. I've never, I've, I have never done that. Steve, uh, I've never did. been involved in oh, drugs or anything executive. like did that. He admit it did he? Yep. I've never done that myself. <laughs> but I, but I have been. You well, let's know, talk and, about the flyers real quick to give some some context to people sure. listening. So we're looking at two flyers. One's about an eight and a half and eleven, which has got a big picture of you photoshopped in a clown outfit juggling. And it's essentially just a, I mean, it's a hatchet job. I mean, it goes down the list that builds a case against you with two uh, references that that support the six points that are above. And the second one is about a uh, uh, four by 11, which is stop Jerry Walker. And the O is replaced with a marijuana leaf. It's actually uh, kind of cute. And Jerry Walker's hijinks, I get it, will ruin <laughs> Crofton for family. So it's your, uh, it's about the marijuana sales. So that, that the, the second flyer is, is solely about Marijuana sales. So Correct. Tell us about that. Correct. So yeah, I'd like to spend some time on that one in particular. About a week before this flyer hit, and a clown there again was on a that one too. there is another clown on that one. Correct. But it's and, not you. And no, it's not me this time. But the the week before this hit, the county executive's office of constituent services sent an email out to all of the homeowners associations in the county quote-unquote, warning them about this piece of legislation that I put in. Now, mind you, if you look back at the history of medical marijuana uh, here in the state, the state legislature passed it. Delegate Kipke, the minority leader who's in charge of sending these mailers out, uh, responsible for them, he voted for medical marijuana in the state. Then when we come down to the council to decide the zoning for where dispensaries and growing operations should be located— most restrictive one in the state. It is. And not only that, but we— debated it at the council. It was the county executive's bill that is the one that ended up passing. And in particular, what happened was it added dispensaries to C2, C3, and C4. Now, we left out C1, and I honestly don't recall why we left out C1. The C is stands for commercial. commercial. These are commercial areas, right? In C1, 2, 3, and 4 are already allowed pharmacies, okay? So some people would argue that this cannabis dispensary is a pharmacy. It's going to have a pharmacy-type look and feel and doctor's prescriptions and things like that. And also, in it mentioned specifically in this mailer, Hold and on, also in the would that also those those designations C one two three would that also authorize alcohol sales? You know, I'm not a hundred percent sure about the alcohol sales. I don't. Uh, I, I have to check that one I'm just, out. I'm just trying to get a yeah, comparison yeah. to. Well, what what I was going to say is what they put in here is things like you know that I'm bringing drugs to Crofton, dry cleaners, you know, dry cleaners, restaurants, daycares, toy stores, grocery stores. So all of these things that are listed on this flyer and are also in the email that were sent out by the county executive's office, all these things are also allowed in C two, C three, and C four. So the county executive's bill already has medical marijuana dispensaries located near. Daycare centers, dry cleaners, restaurants, and it's pharmacies. Just a funny list too. Like, just go, like if you're going to start with like schools and daycares, I get it. But then near your dry cleaner, be careful. Toy it's, stores. It's, uh, it, well, the, toy it, stores. have got one going in just on the county line, right? Right with the county city, and it Correct. is within as the crow flies some feet of a school. And I know that the, the city council 
pitched a fit on that, and mm-hmm. the county basically said, "Well, no, you know, this is it, it is what it is, and you know, we've got to go with it." Yeah. Well, I mean, it, the the thing that is the worst about this is if you just look at this particular flyer. Now, this one was mailed to Crofton, and it says it shows a map on the one side, and it has five different locations, and each location that's identified has a little marijuana leaf on it, and it says that I want to bring five of these. It doesn't say medical marijuana. It says marijuana dispensaries, and the email calls them retail marijuana shops to Crofton. They mailed a similar mailer that was customized to the Crownsville, Millersville, and Gambrels residents that are in District 33. They mailed another one to Severna Park. They mailed another one to Cape St. Clair and um, St. Margaret's area. Each one has its own customized map with its own number of dispensaries. And so this one has five. The Severna Park one, I think, has 10. The one in Crownsville, Millersville, Gambrels has seven. The one down in the uh, uh, Cape St. Clair area has three. So if you add them all up, it was well over 20, apparently 20 locations that I'm bringing uh, marijuana dispensaries to. But the state law, the state law that was passed that Delegate Kipke voted for only allows two medical marijuana dispensaries per Senate district. So they have lied to the voters by suggesting that there's 20-something medical marijuana so dispensaries you've got, you've coming got, to and, a district. your district, does that cover two Senate districts? It covers just one. I'm, I'm a, so there's for every Senate district, there's three delegates, right? So the state senator for our district is, is District 33 is Ed Riley, right. and then the three delegates are underneath him. So okay. I'm running for one of those three delegate spots. So that it, all those cities that I just mentioned, when you add up cumulatively all of the medical marijuana dispensaries they're suggesting that I'm that I'm bringing to their area. The reality is the state law only allows two, two in the whole Senate district, and they've only the state only licensed one. They only accepted one license, and there's only one applicant moving forward. Look at that. There's two within a block of each other. <laughs> yeah. Well. Uh, oh, so yeah. That's so I mean, maybe that's down into the into the details that maybe is too so. much. But I think I mean the, the, my point is that this is misleading it's, the voters. It's totally it's, misleading. it's it's misleading the voters to suggest that I am bringing pot shops for lack of better well, terms. First of all, to, you don't bring them. I mean, whoever the market is going to bring them. They're regulated by law. Correct. By the county council. And as you say, it's two per Senate district. So between Crofton, Davidsonville? It, yeah. So the district runs through Crofton, down through Davidsonville, down to Harwood, right. and then parts of Riva. It goes up through Gambrels, Millersville. It goes all the way up to Severn, right around Archbishop Spalding. Then it comes down uh, the, through Crownsville, just shy of Annapolis Mall, and comes all, mostly all the way down the Broadneck Peninsula to include Severna Park, uh, Arnold, it's Cape St. Right, Clair, except that, that whole lower area. part of South little, Tennessee. Yeah, a little section of uh, Arnold Which there. Which comes not in a, John Astle's district. Correct, but, correct. Um, so within that area, there's two. Correct. That whole allowed. area, there's only two allowed by law. And, and, and they're and suggesting that I'm bringing t- right. over 20 now, to that location. Now, your district also, uh, along with South County, is right for the, the the producers. Correct, the growers. The growers. Okay, correct. and that's not that's not happening in Severna Park or Arnold? Or no, it's not. West. There's only 15 licenses uh, that the state Statewide. law that the state law allowed was 15 growing licenses. Licenses. And there is one that happens to be located here in Anne Arundel County in the southern part of the county uh, that is in my current council district. Okay. Yeah, they're generally one per county around there. I don't know if that's yeah, they signed. I think they tried to spread them out. There are some Eastern Shore, but... Western Maryland. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I looked them all up, and they're all LLCs, and they're all you know. I mean, most of them are current growers because they have the facilities in place already. Correct. Um, Somebody with experience, horticultural so you, experience. Yeah, yeah. You've, got, you've got growers, dispensaries, and what is the third? Processors. Process. Processors. So after the product is grown, then they process it. And, and then the processors uh, need to be co-located with the growers, correct? I believe. I don't. Think, I don't think they don't have think to be. Necessary. No, no, it's not necessary. necessary. Yeah. So There's a separate I, I, set of licenses. I mean, anything is, in marijuana, then realistically, we might have three to four marijuana-related so businesses within the in, district. At in this the point. count, in, yeah, in the county, there would be a maximum of of ten dispensaries potentially because you have two per Senate district. There's four Senate districts wholly located in Anne Arundel County, right. and then there's a partial Senate district. We have twenty one, which comes from Prince George's right. County over into the western part of Anne Arundel. So there potentially they could locate one of those District twenty one ones in Anne Arundel County, but more than likely, I would assume they're probably going to be over in Prince George's because we have a very small percentage of that that Senate district. It's how a do very your, how do your constituents smidge. feel about marijuana dispensaries? Do you know? I, I don't. I don't know the answer to that. Um, I will tell you in knocking on doors since. That some of these mailers have gone out. People had questions, and I did get some folks who emailed me and said, "Hey, you know, can you just explain this? It uh, obviously looks like a hit piece." Um, the first one for Crofton actually had my county email printed on it and said people to contact me and my county office phone number. Uh, the the uh, the other ones that were printed 
later did they took that off um so i haven't been able to you know get feedback directly from some folks but i did you know people that know me emailed me and said hey what's going on this looks kind of strange but can you just fill me in and explain to what's going on and so when you know when i take people through the explanation and say Look, there's only two in the whole district allowed this is silly they're like yeah we agree that doesn't even make it, it's totally misleading now as now as delegate kipke or the county executive addressed any of this to you uh, no. no, their county executive. I said something to him about the mailers the other day, and he kind of tried to act like he didn't know what they were, and then kind of laughed and walked. How away. does he explain the email coming from his office? Uh, I haven't asked him about that, <laughs> but I plan to talk about that at my press conference tomorrow. But how does the central committee handle something like this? Like, is it a headache? Kind of like where they see this as kind of infighting, or is this device, divisive? I, I don't mean, know how the central committee feels about it. To be honest, um, I haven't talked to any of the members. Say, right, everyone, everyone, let's let's back off because let's do this internally or what have you. It's, I couldn't tell you that. Couldn't tell you that answer. Hmm. Haven't I haven't spoken to them, but it always is fascinating to me when it comes to literature and it comes to uh, collateral when it, uh, election collateral. There really is no there is no recourse. You know that someone can you can build a narrative and there's really nothing you can do about it because they're putting you in a defensive position. And this sure. is nothing. This is nothing new. I mean, no. is, you can so you can no. take something you twist it because you're trying to define the battle on your terms Correct. and the energy that's taken. On your part, I mean, you're sitting with us here on a Thursday afternoon mm-hmm. um, addressing this instead of moving forward, you know, a campaign or what have you, mm-hmm. because you have to play defense. Well, and not just this, but I've also had to spend money responding to the first piece, and I'm Which working on by a, design. You know, right, exactly. I'm working on a second piece to respond to the, you know, the marijuana pieces. Now, now the, 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 the PAC or the, the uh, organizations sending them out, I mean, they, they can spend their money how they want to. They can. So legally, yes, Nan- they can. Nancy, Nancy Schramm is an employee of the county. She's correct. head of constituent services, correct? Correct. And you said that was an email sent out by county email? It was email? sent out through her county email address to all the homeowners associations in the county, warning them about the bill. And it was, it was written in such a way that it was... Um, sort of like, oh, this is just informational, and if you'd like to come down, if you'd like to contact all the council members, here's all their names and addresses. And But it was written in such a way, in my opinion, as to do the same thing this mailer was designed to do, and that is to scare people into reacting to it, which a number of folks did in emailing me and call- calling me. But when I explained to them what was going on, then obviously they calmed down, and I ended up actually withdrawing the bill, and it had nothing to do with the emails that was sent out. I had introduced the bill specifically because there was, you know, the state has given all of the dispensary licenses a deadline to find a location and be in that location or be moving toward being in that location by the end of this year. And so we had one dispensary that was trying to find a location in District 32, uh, and they had not they were not been successful in locating it. And so they needed, they found a property that was a C1 property that they felt like would work. And they came to me and said, look, do you recall why it wasn't added in? C1 is commercial, very similar to the C2, 3, and 4. Why can't we just put that in? And I said, that makes sense. Sure, no problem. Put the bill in, then subsequent to it being put in, they contacted me again and said, never mind, we're sorry, we found a C2 property that's going to work. So we didn't need it, so I pulled it back. It just sort of dawned on me that this is all water over the dam, okay? You're running for District 33. Correct. Your time here at the county is done, in lame duck, whatever you want to call it. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, you're, you, you're, you're a short-term or senioritis. La- <laughs> last year, last year on the council. Um, I'm actually going to miss it. I, I love council. You know, you're, I mean, I mean you're, you're on the way out. Um, the law has passed in Maryland. It has. We are in the process of establishing growers, mm-hmm. establishing Establishing processors, building dispensaries. I mean, I know there's two in construction, uh, one in Edgewater, I know one in Annapolis, mm-hmm. I think in Linthicum is just starting another one. Mm-hmm. How as a delegate are you bringing marijuana? I mean, it's it, the horse is out of the barn, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I think what they're trying to do, obviously, is, and I, you know, I don't, again, I'm not sure why they chose this specific topic, other than that they felt like they could incite fear in people well, and that somehow it's my I'm it's my fault that I'm to blame if all of these locations turn into quote unquote retail marijuana locations well, when in actuality they're medical a cannabis conservative so and this is an issue that conserve if you pull people I think more conservatives are coming over to legalization because it re- it speaks to their uh, libertarian views that goes with conservatism to some point but you know I think you know most People who are conservative tend to be older, and they're not going to be receptive to marijuana. Even although the polls are showing across the board that even they're passing something, in New, they're going to pass something in New Jersey that's yeah. for recreational, not just medicinal. Right. So I think, yeah, even though it's passed, and like you said, it's water in the bridge and the horses out of the barn. Two analogies yeah. right there in the same breath. This is a, it's a wedge issue. You know, it I is, and that's what they're trying to do. Do you see an end in sight? 
No, I mean, I fully suspect they'll probably continue this this level of, you know, mail and, and negativity between now and the election. Uh, I mean, you, I you, you're, you're calling them out. I, I plan on you don't it. Have to, you, you can't not. I have to. I have to address it. I can't, I can't not address it, no, especially when it's, compl- it's absolutely lies. I mean, that's really what it boils down to, especially this mailer here. The other one, yeah, those are twisted things that they, they schemed up and came up with that they took truth or facts and twisted them around to make them to the, into their narrative, right? Most of those aren't accurate, but they're painted in a way to make me look bad. Okay, that's fine. But now we've got this, which is just it's just a flat out lie. What's what's a politician to do? I mean, how do you fight this? I do exactly what we're doing right here. Sit down and have a conversation about it, put it out there and let people make the decision for themselves. I mean, the mailers of your own. Uh, yeah. I've already had a mailer respond to the first clown mailer they sent out and laid out the record, my record, my voting record on taxes and, and fiscal issues and some of the things that I've done for the county in the past seven years. People have had the same people that got that got my response piece. So I'm going to send this again to the same We don't voters. have a Get High with Jerry website out there yet, do we? Well, well, they, they've got a website on here that's, you know, promoting uh, why they think I should be uh, removed. It's the only issue with putting a, you on the defensive that all of a sudden that you're burning through money that you'll be using for uh, for the primary. Absolutely. So this could be political strategy to provoke a, a, a response. Well, not just primary, but general, too. I mean, I you know, again, sort of like what you said earlier, like if they start attacking me now, what kind of position does that put me into win when I make it through the primary? And then am I draining my resources now just so I'm – then I'm dry at the, at the primary, and then I got to run for the general, and I've got all I've spent all my money defending my record and uh, defending against attacks and lies. Well, it was interesting because if you look at the mayoral election, and I think you know it was very similar to the mailers they put out, but you can understand that one because that was partisan, and you know as it should be, mm-hmm. so that they were choosing you know to to take on the Democrats. But the issue I saw with this internally is, well, if you look at what happened in the mayoral election, there's a lot of us, including myself, who really think that that really damaged uh, Mayor Panelidis efforts. Oh, I forward. listen, I, I agree 100%. So, I there's no doubt in my mind that that hurt him. And I think he knew that too. As a matter of fact, if there's a video on one of the news sites, uh, I think it might have been the Capitol where they took the video like right at, at the same night there at the end um, of after he had, you know, c- conceded to Gavin and he came out and the reporter asked him, you know, do you feel like there's anything that happened in the end of the campaign that negatively impacted your, you know, outcome and he said, "Yes, the mailers absolutely did." You know, he felt that way. And I, I you know, I believe him. I don't think he knew about those mailers coming out, but I think the county executive and and the minority leader thought they were going to help, and instead, I think they hurt, and it backfired on him big time. So that's what I'm looking at your primary opponents when all of a sudden that this is really hurting them, their chances. Uh, well, against you, but if they go once they clear the primary in the general, so I mean, it may be damaging the candidate moving forward. Uh, no, no question. And uh, my, I guess the, uh, the other disappointing part was at least with the mayor. You know, he came out and, and denounced them and said, you right. know, I don't. Th- this is terrible. I didn't do this. I have nothing to do with it. You know, this is not my campaign doing this. Got to be honest. I'm disappointed that the three delegates haven't that are sitting haven't stepped up and said the same thing well, and said this is. <laughs> Uh, and, and it certainly didn't didn't work the way they intended, and I don't see it working the way it intended here. I mean, this is— Well, I certainly hope is, not, and that's part of why I'm doing what I'm doing sitting right here is have, trying to have a conversation with you all and get the sort of message out there that what's being said in these things isn't true. And not only that, but it's <laughs> lying straight to the voters when the people who are behind this know what the law is because they voted for the law <laughs> at so, the state level. So switching from defense to offense, so moving sure. forward because your, your campaign— for county council is probably going to differ fairly significantly, or maybe not, for delegate. So how do you change your strategy moving forward? I mean, I think, you know, my my focus on the council, obviously, it's a lot different at the state level than county t- type issues, right? You know, here you're dealing with police and you're dealing with fire and roads and water and sewer and trash collection and public schools. And, and while you do deal with some of those same types of issues at the state level, one of the things that I've really spent a lot of time doing is each year is spent a lot of time in the budget <clears throat> and um, really understanding how that works and getting the feel for what's in there and how it's structured and what we can do to make changes to it. You know, and a couple of things I'll just say that I'm proud of, you know, over the course of the seven years I've been on the council, when we came in, as you recall, in the 2010, we were still in sort of a recession at that point, right? And we actually, at the county level in our budget, we had a structural deficit of around $45 million in the very first budget. And by the time we got through the end of my first term, we had that down to about seven or $8 million. We worked very diligently to to reduce that structural deficit. 
And now it's actually eliminated. Uh, in the first budget that the county executive introduced, he actually introduced a budget that increased the structural deficit back up to $25 million, which is one of the battles we sort of got into on that first budget. Because a number of us had worked very diligently to get that structural deficit down. And so that's one thing I'm very proud of is that now it is eliminated and we're operating on the money that we're receiving from our citizens. The other thing that we did too, which was, again, something that was related to the recession, was the was that we had drained all of our sort of piggy banks, if you will. Through the recession, every little pot of money that we had set aside for this project or that thing or another, we were using to fund our operating budget, and we had raided all of those things, and we had taken our rainy day fund. Rainy day fund is only to be used when the budget, when we, when we estimate that the revenue is going to come at a certain level and it has a shortfall. Right. So we went into that rainy day fund, we, saying me on the council and the previous county council that was on before we got there, they had already wiped it out. It was down to zero. And so we have spent a, a very concerted effort to build that rainy day fund back up again to the point where we have some reserves so that if we fall into a, a recession again, that we have backup funding to help the, you know, the county continue to operate. And so those two things are two of the things that I'm most proud of. The other, the other big financial issue that I was focused on and actually worked with a number of my colleagues. Mr. Ladd and Mr. Benoit both was on the health care liability that was sitting out there. We had a $1.2 billion retiree health care liability, and we, we cut that in half um, based on a piece of legislation that we put in while Ms. Newman was in office. And it took us a year to develop that. We worked every week. We met with the administration, members of the unions, members of the uh, non-represented employees, and we sat around a table and worked through those issues. And it was especially tough because, as you all know, that was part of the you know Obamacare, Affordable Care Act, a lot of the things that were coming down and the costs were continuing to rise eyes on us. And we had set up years ago, I say we, the county had set up years ago, a system where if you work for the county for five years, you had 80% coverage of your health care when you retired. So somebody could come in at 19, work five years, get out of 24, go have a job wherever they wanted to. And when they retired, yeah. And then when they retired at 65, they had 80% of their health care coverage. That was unsustainable. And so we worked very diligently on that and saved the taxpayers hundreds of millions of dollars. You know, those are types of things that I, you know, enjoy working working on and I hope to take that same level of interest to the General Assembly. Uh, one of the things that I think that uh, has been most interesting for me in my first term was that five of the seven members of the council at that point were brand new when we came on. And I'd never worked in government before, but I actually developed a real passion for county government. It's one of the reasons why I want to come back and run for county executive at some point, because I love my county. And I love how county government is closest to the people and how it serves the people. And that's really what its mission should be. And so after the first four years, I decided that if I didn't get elected to my second term, I was going to go to law school. And if I did get reelected, I was going to go back and get my master's because I just (laughs) couldn't figure out how to go to law school, be a councilman and have a regular full time job. But I went back and um, got my master's degree in public administration and public policy. And it was really most interesting because it gives you, you know, when you're a councilman with no background and experience in government, you get sort of like on the job training, right? You kind of get thrown into the deep end of the pool and you're you know, the water's coming at you so fast, uh, it's like trying to drink water out of a fire hose. And so you learn over a period of a couple years how the whole system works and then how you can be most effective in it. And then I wanted that educational piece. I went back and sort of got the educational and then was able to combine that with my on-the-job training, if you will, and feel like I'm a better legislator because of that, the the combination of the educational component and the actual, you know, on-the-job training. So now do you... Is this your full-time gig? It's not. I work for a small business. Okay. We sell and service copier equipment for Sharp Electronics and Konica Minolta. It's okay. a family-owned business that the company has started back in the 60s, and I've worked for them for over 21 years. Okay, and you haven't been haven't divorced yet, and your kids still remember what Correct. you look like? Correct. And- Correct. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that is a challenge these days, I will have to admit. The answer to that was yes. Yeah, I will, I will admit that <laughs> is a challenge. John going to stop. Exactly. <laughs> hey, I've got a quick question for you. I mean, you've got a lot of institutional knowledge. You've gone through three county executives at this point in your two, three, four, three. 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 Um, and I asked uh, Chief Davis or Commissioner Davis when we spoke with him up in Baltimore a couple weeks ago. Name dropper. Um, yeah. Laura Newman. Have we heard the last of her? Uh, I don't think so. And I hope not. Elected? I think so. I, I would say so. I mean, I think, you know, it's I think she and I just have spoken to her recently and I stay in touch with her from time to time. Um, we were at a, an event uh, most recently. It was a celebration of uh, the former fire chief, Mike Cox's 50th right. birthday. And so I, she guy. was the, he's a great guy. She was there. I was there and a number of other folks that served in her administration were there celebrating with him. And uh, you know, we kind of had a little brief conversation about it. And I, I, you know, I think I think she got into it and I think she really developed a passion for it. And she had that sort of experience where she wanted to serve and you know, have, have a role in 
public service. I think once she got into that role, I think she really found something that she enjoyed doing. And I, I suspect she'll be back. I have strong I think so, that. too. I, th- I, I told her that we had brunch at the Rams head one time. And she said, absolutely not. If she loses, if she loses this primary, she's done. She'll never run again. I said, you're full of it. And, and, we, and she owes me a lunch if... <laughs> if, if I'm right. Well, you get the bug, I think. And yeah. Kevin, Kevin Day's, and I, I think she's probably just waiting for some right time, too. I mean, I think I she's think looking right. for her son and daughter to get, you know, yeah, they're in, young. in a they're good young place kids. and everything else. And, and figure it's out it's hard when you have young there. kids. It really is. So. No, it really is. All right. Well, where, where can we learn more about you? I know you've got jerrywalker.org, which is your campaign site, which is not quite. It's not up and running, but it's, and... it's there. Yep. I'm working on it right now. Well, you're a little early to the party anyway. I think now yeah. everyone's starting to kind of jockey for position. Correct. It'll be up after the first of the year. So. Okay. And, you know, if, if anybody has is receiving these mailers, uh, receiving emails or whatnot, and they, they want to talk to the horse's mouth. That's the best thing I recommend. You know. Reach, yep. reach out. And, and honestly, I've, it's interesting because I've had people that have, you know, posted things on Facebook and tagged me in it. And then I've been able to respond to that publicly because they've tagged me publicly. And other people who have private messaged me and other people who have emailed me and other people have called me. So whatever way you want to get a hold of me, I'm happy to have a conversation about not just this mailer, but any of the issues that are getting ready to come up. Because I'm sure they've got other ones in the queue um, that are coming. And I I stand by everything I voted for. When someone has a question about it, I'm happy to explain my thought process behind why I voted for something. And if they, you know, we obviously aren't going to agree 100% of the time on everything, but I'm I'm more than willing to share my thoughts and why I voted on something a certain way. So... People Absolutely. just need to reach out and ask me, and I'm happy to what, share. What's the best way to get a hold of you, then? Would you, would, would um, you prefer? Do you have a preference? The email is probably the best way, jerry at jerrywalker.org. Okay. And it's pretty straightforward. And that um, is a and J. It's, it is a, a J. R R Y, like the subs and pizza place. You got it. <laughs> I wish I was related to that guy. Yeah, I don't know. They're not doing too good down in Annapolis. Is that right? Okay. I don't know how they stay in it. It's, always, it's always pretty quiet there. Uh, Anne Arundel County Councilman for District 7, Jerry Walker, thank you very much for your time here at the Nautilus Diner in uh, – Lovely Crofton. My pleasure. And uh, I'm excited. One last thing. I'm really excited. And I don't come up here that that often. But the money that Hogan has put in for the improvements on this corridor. Because I, I listen to everybody down in Annapolis bitch about Forest Drive. I'm like, my ortho, ortho, orthopedist was right up here. And I said, oh, yeah, you, you, just, you just come up here. And, and try it, this out. It is a challenge, and it's something we've been focused on. And I was very thankful the governor decided to, to use this corridor as one of the uh, places that he targeted his funding for this uh, new computerized sequencing of the traffic right. signals. It's going to be great. I think it'll be right. awesome for our I residents. Mean, in Anne County, they got, what, Route 2 down through Lake Severna Park, through Brooklyn, Rich Severna Park, and Arnold. They've Correct. got this Route 3 corridor down through yep. Crofton Gambrels. Yep. And there was one other one in Anne Arundel. I can't was it remember. up near the fort, maybe? or I'm not yeah, sure. I'm not I can't sure. remember. I've got, to, I've got to look back on that. But Well, thank you very much for your time. My pleasure. Um, good luck in your campaign. Thank and you very much. People that are looking for information, jerry at jerrywalker.org, or you can go to jerrywalker.org, I guess, you know, fairly soon, and yep. uh, find everything else. He'll probably have all the refusions. Is that a word? I just made it up of his... Uh, of the mailers that may be out there. But uh, don't take everything at face value. If that's one thing we learned in Annapolis, it looks like it's something that we're going to need to learn again as we move into the House of Delegate race and the county races next year in 2018. Thank you very much. Thank you. And if I was running for delegate, I'd be pissed off too. I, You know, I often think about this with, especially recently with the the city elections, just about, you know, the flyers that went out and everything. And I think we oftentimes think that this is something new, but it's really not. I mean, this has been around since time immemorial. Well, it, it has. I mean, what's unique about Jerry Walker is that it's in a primary. Right. And it's by his own party. That's interesting. I I mean, that's... I mean, they're eating their own, and they've got, oh, you know, with, in Tony McConkey, they've got a, a controversial candidate uh, that that's not necessarily safe. And I'll tell you, these these flyers that we saw from Jerry, they smack of the same design same and everything style, else yeah. of, that we saw here coming out against Gavin Buckley. So I'm wondering whether the Prince of Darkness uh, <laughs> is is involved with this one again. What's interesting about this uh, for me is that, you know, if you look at the way the primaries generally run, and if you, you look at the presidential primacy, pri- primary, you know, between Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton and, and Hillary and, and Bernie and, and especially among all of the Republicans— is that, you know, in, in the primary, you can be banging each other uh, and trying to damage each other's brand in order to get that secure the nomination. And then once it's in the general, everyone pulls back together. But it's rare that you see the the attacks coming from the leadership or the central committee. You know, that's, I mean, it happens from time to time. But, I mean, to me, that's a dangerous prospect because you risk damaging a candidate in 
the uh, general if they get past the primary. You know, you would have, and, and I don't know when these specifically started. We should have probably asked Jerry on this, but you know, you would have thought they would have learned in Annapolis. I mean, it, the, I don't know that the Flyers and Mike Panalides had said that the Flyers did not cost him the election, but they certainly didn't help him. No, they didn't. I mean, <clears throat> if it had been a closer election, I think they would have co- cost him. I just think that you know, the election in Annapolis was just the natural order of things. Well, you look at Jerry Walker. There it is. Of there's, there's my phone. Uh, but you look at Jerry Walker's race. And I mean, he's got three people. It's a tight race. You know, you've got a Democratic challenger on that side. So you turn around and you divide that, that you know, three, four-way Republican race. You put a splinter into that. Very likely, you'll see some people shift over to that Democrat. I bet, I bet you they lose a seat on that in that district. Yeah, I think it's a miscalculation. I mean, personally, I, mean, I find it fascinating. I'm not going to lie. I mean, it's it, but it's the calculus you do. You always think that the political operatives that are involved in the campaigns know more than you do because you think, well, they've done this before. They know they know the ins and outs. But if that were the case, then they'd win every time. You know, so you know they're making a calculated risk. I, I think this is a I, I think this is a high risk, low payoff for them um, because all they can do is damage their side. But so it's it is. I mean, I mean, I, I think let Jerry, Tony, Mike and uh, Sid slug it out among themselves and let the voters decide as opposed to having a central committee jump in on there. But I think it's uh, very interesting that it appears that Nick Kipke and Steve Shue are both involved in this as well. So it'd be interesting to see how this all plays out for everybody. I know uh, if I was running, I'd be pissed. Well, I think it's a you know, if you look, this is the, the Republican strategy and it has been for a while is to started ground level, where they want to start winning municipal elections and local elections and build up. And they've been working on this for a couple of years, and it's and it's been very successful, actually. So I think, you know, you would think in Maryland that's very difficult. But, you know, Maryland's not pure blue. As we know, there's pockets of red, and you can obviously win those elections. Uh, and you can you can get a, uh, even in some Democratic areas, you can get a, a Republican in. I mean, the, Annapolis election is a perfect example of that, whether it was an anomaly or not. But well, the state of Maryland is a perfect example yeah, of that Yeah, as well. exactly. Well, I, I mean, you look, Anne Arundel County tends to be a very red county, and in, in historically they do, but they do elect Democrats. I mean, we've had, we had Janet Owens for two terms here, and, it, and it's been a while since we've had a Democrat, but I mean, it can happen. And I think right now you've got, you know, you look on the national level, you've got President Trump that wrote in on this sort of an— Populism. You know, on, you've got Governor Hogan that, that wrote in on this, and you've got County Executive Steve Shue, and I think that they—I think there's a—, a big miscalculation on that point that this is, you know, just some sort of Republican stronghold that they can run roughshod over whatever they want to do and control whatever, you know, well, we're going to we're going to control the Annapolis elections and we're going to put who we want in the Annapolis and we're going to control the House of Delegates. And and I will see. Well, I'm curious as to how much of that is a, is a calculated strategy versus how much is a just kind of people freestyling. I, I would ha- I would have a hard time believing that the Republican Central Committee approved this, but I don't know. Well, it's not. It's the it's the House Caucus. It's the House Republican Caucus, which is headed by the state Republican Party and you know, Nick Kip, Delegate Nick Kipke. And I have a real tough word on tough time saying that. What is it Polish Kipke? I'm not sure what it is. It's Eastern European, I think. It's, but I got a problem with him. He's you know as as far as responsiveness, I have reached out to Delegate Kipke by Twitter, by email, and by phone message. And this is going back to when he was attacked by a dog up in Pasadena that we wanted to talk to him. So this is going back probably about four or five months. Not a phone call back, not an email back, not even an acknowledgement or anything like that. I don't know whether he realizes that I'm not one of his constituents and it doesn't matter or 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 whatever. But I mean, we'd love to talk to him, love to have him on the podcast and discuss. I mean, now now we've got a little bit more than a dog bite to talk about. Yeah. Uh, although I would like to talk about the dog bite too. I think that they, uh, well, I, I mean, they, they bring that up periodically, these banning breeds. Oh, yeah. And it, it was a pit bull, I believe, that, that attacked. It was actually going after his child, and he sort of held his child away and took the bite. Uh, so I, w- I would love to talk to him. So if he's hearing this or if anybody that's sitting in there having lunch with him listening to this, say, hey, Nick, give us a call. We'd love to talk to you. Anyway, speaking of politicians, next week we have— Former uh, politician. Former politician. So we have uh, a good friend. He is our good friend, both of us, Jared Lippman, who is Ward 5 Alderman in the city of Annapolis. And the reason we're having him on is going to be a little bit of a different perspective. We're going to have him on not so much to talk about the legislative accomplishments and all Yeah, we're going to shut him down. I want to shut him down if he goes, well, we did the forest concert. No. <laughs> I, we want to know what it's like behind the curtain, what it's like to be an elected official. What, you know, regular, he's a regular guy. He ran. He won. He was— by well, he didn't run. He got appointed. Appointed, then ran. And then ran, then won. Uh, and by all accounts, a, a very popular, uh, very successful legislator. 
Um, With zero experience going into it. Right. So, you know, he, he cranked out uh, a ton of legislation while he was in there. Uh, very active. He was not a wallflower. But we want to know what it's like behind the scenes, what it's like getting elected, what it's like running, what it's like, you know, your first meeting. You know, well, I, th- I think the interesting thing about this one will be is that we've got so many people that have, since the election of President Trump, have become interested in off- in running for office without any experience. We've got them running on the city council. We had several people that have one office that have had no experience. We look at the county council coming up next year. You look at the House of Delegates and the Senate that's running up next year. All these people that have had no experience in the political circle. And I think this would be a real good, you know, insight into what to expect. How do you run a campaign? How do you how do you navigate that first year in office? How do you work when your uh, you know, your mayor is of a different party and the totally different belief system, if you will. Well, it even boils down to more than that, because, you know, a lot of the podcasts I listen to right now, you know, they're political, obviously, but they're pushing, they're saying, hey, run, run for office, run for municipality, run for your county, just get out there and and run for office. And I thought, well, great, but if I got, I wouldn't know how to write legislation. I wouldn't know, you know, how the mechanics behind a meeting goes beyond Robert's rules of order and, you know, how a budget, I mean, we know this stuff from the outside, but once you get in, I mean, how do you, how do you learn all that stuff? I mean, that's got to be pretty big learning curves. And you always I always thought, man, I could run, but could I actually do it? And then you say, there's other people who do it who with no experience. Well, you do. I mean, you get in, you look all the way up to the president. I mean, he's never, never run a government before. Uh, so it's, it's inter- it'll, it'll be very interesting. I think I'm, I'm uh, looking forward to hearing from him and seeing what that goes. Uh, but before we get to Alderman Littman, we need to get through Thanksgiving, yep. which is now. Now. And uh, we just wanted to quick say a very happy Thanksgiving to everybody that's listening. Thank you all for listening. Thank you for sticking with us for this. We're almost, um, what, how many episodes have we got? We got like, we, we're coming up close to 100 episodes, I think. Well, I mean, you add up all the crab cakes and everything, we got a ton, but yeah. no, that's kind of cheating. But um, so we'd be at, you know, I don't know. We're like 65, 67, something like so that. we're close. Um, but thank you for sticking us around. I appreciate that. Yeah. Jim appreciates that. We know that. some are better than others. We're not, we're not idiots. Uh-huh. I mean, we, kind of, we are, but I mean, it's. Which was the worst one? Hmm. Well, there was that one for election night we didn't air because we thought that would go a whole different way. But then all of a sudden, we thought it would be an all-night affair. And then all of a sudden, they're like, and Gavin won. So that never aired, and it kind of sucked. Right. So I'm glad it didn't. The, the one that I liked the best so far, and I'm, I'm not saying this because pissing me off, but I, it was the one I did with uh, Ted Levitt, and you weren't able to make that yeah. one. And I, I just Which really, is why we're looking for a third mic. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I just really, I really enjoyed that. I enjoyed the, you know, the insight and the unvarnished conversation that we had there. I like the people who totally get it. You know, there's sometimes you'll hear, uh, you'll, you'll hear someone come on and they think it's like a radio show and they're stiff and formal. You can never get them to kind of completely relax. And there's some people who just totally get it right off the bat. Wes Adams was certainly like that. Peter Franchot. Peter Franchot, Alex Pine. Um, certainly Governor Hogan. Governor, yeah, the, these were all people that just, just knew we were just hanging out and it wasn't anything too serious. But th- those are the fun ones. So. I agree. So, uh, and that's what we're thankful for. So, uh, boy, isn't that, isn't, that, isn't that like a tug at your heart to moment there? That's what we're thankful for. I teared for up a listeners. little. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I feel like those women on Saturday Night Live. Thanksgiving but, anyhow, so we have Alderman Jared Lindman, former Alderman Jared. Well, I guess he's currently. When, no. will that, when will that air? That will air. Actually, that will air the day that he is unaldermaned. So we're, we're looking to that. And make sure that you follow us for all the places. Our website is themarylandcrabs.com. The Twitter is MD Crabs Podcast. Facebook, we've got the Maryland Crabs Podcast. We've got a page and a group. Email. If you want to join us, that would be great. And, and it's not just one person. I mean, we could even probably take a couple people to, to do it, I mean, yeah. as, as we do. Uh, shoot us an email at info at themarylandcrabs.com. Uh, you can call Tim at home. He prefers <laughs> 2.30 a.m. His number is 443. Actually, I am up at 2.30, so <laughs> that's when everyone calls me, so it's not a big deal. Um, um, but, yeah, no, uh, if, if you're interested, if you know, give us a shout. Stay tuned. And, uh, again, thank you very much to Jerry Walker for uh, coming on on such short notice. And... I look forward to talking with Jared Lippman in a little bit. And I look forward to leaving Altona. This has been the Maryland Crabs podcast with Tim Hamilton and John Fernay. Sure to follow them in all the regular places, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and online at themarylandcrabs.com. Take a moment to rate us on iTunes. Now, get the hell out of my kitchen. Seriously, go! You're still here? It's over. Go home. Go.